I'm Jeff Yager. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics. And I'm Vladimir Mojica. I'm a professor of chemistry, School of Molecular Sciences. So, Vladi, today we're making a video to look at in Atkins, Physical Chemistry for the Life Sciences, the textbook, specifically edition number two. In chapter four is where they introduce and start covering chemical equilibria. And specifically, we're going to look at uh, a specific discussion question, which is kind of looking at, at some of the general, um, asking you to, to do some general concepts and understand some general concepts behind what was discussed in this chapter. And so discussion question number two is explain how a reaction that is not spontaneous may be driven forward by coupling it to a spontaneous reaction. And I think the reason we uh, picked this to look at is because this is something that's very relevant, especially in biochemistry. Oh. Um, very, so, very, very, so, very so discussing this in yeah. a very general terms, and it touches on, you know, a lot of the key aspects of uh, this chapter, which is what does it mean for a reaction to be spontaneous, to be, you know, not to, to be not spontaneous versus spontaneous, et cetera. And so I think that's part of what we're going to look at when we look at some of this question. Yeah. Right? I, just as a, a general consideration, we, we've got to understand that in, in biological systems, if we think of ourselves, our body, in our body, there are Millions of reactions that are important. I don't know. There are Anyhow, some, so many, right? Some of the most important reactions in biology, they are not spontaneous. So now the question is, how come? Well, if you if you look at thermodynamics, I mean the basic, the second law of thermodynamics tells you that the, the entropy of the universe has got to increase in any thermodynamic process, spontaneous or not spontaneous. Now. The thing is that, so, so how come we can drive a reaction that is not spontaneous? The, the, the answer is that we are not isolated systems. This is the basic uh, answer. Now, once you accept that you can couple a system to another system and get part of the free energy from the spontaneous reaction to drive your non-spontaneous reaction, then it becomes a very simple idea. But in reality, you have to understand that this is connected to the entropy the entropy variation of the universe, the system, and the environment. In fact, you know, just to kind of, what I would say, throw some real things to, to th that general statement, like you said, like one of the main things, and I hate to be so vague and just put, you know, A going to B, uh, that seems like way too much of a chemist thing to do. But, you know, in biology, seeing something like this, you know, but where you see something up here where it's another reaction. And let's just pick something that they would often see so commonly it's ridiculous, something like ATP, you know, uh, ADP, you know, because it's known as one of the, you know, molecular energy molecules of the cell, et cetera. In other words, you know, a triphosphate hydrolyzing, losing to a diphosphate. And, you know, by knowing that the free energy of that is largely negative, you know, that can often drive things that normally in their own free energy would not move in that spontaneous direction, right? right? That, that's just to put a real concrete one that, that in biology gets used you know, yeah. all the time. And right. it is not, and it is not entirely the same question, but it is very much related. You see, the the temperature of our bodies in in Celsius is what around three, thirty eight, thirty seven. Yep. Yeah. So now many of the reactions in our body, if you if you if you take that reaction and try to to to, to get the same reaction outside your body. It doesn't happen. And now the question is, is it related to this or not? Not completely because this is related to the role of a catalyst in these enzymes. Right. But it is deeply connected. Once we understand the role of a catalyst in terms of a chemical reaction, so then we, we, we will be able to connect spontaneous, non-spontaneous, happening at a certain temperature, not happening at, an, at, a, at another temperature. If we try to do some of these reactions outside the body, we will have to use temperatures perhaps close to 100 degrees. Now that will kill us. So right. biology is such that it, it, it has it, found it, lots it, it, of it's ways. It's found evolution 
is such that I found lots of way for our body to, to function in a very narrow temperature window and on the conditions that we make massive use of the fact that we are not isolated systems. Right, and, and not only, I, I like to mention here, not only from the thermodynamic standpoint are these, you know, protein catalysts or, you know, catalyst enzymes, as we would generally say in biochemistry, um, you know, protein-based catalysts, um, you know, important for thermodynamics, but they also play such a big role in kinetics as well by lowering activation, changing active, not only time scales for reactions, but also their true thermodynamics as well. So um, in looking kind of further into this question, um, you know, of, you know, how this can happen, I think, you know, what's really important to be able to do is, is what you've uh, shown here, which is just to make sure that we have some general understanding of what we mean by a spontaneous reaction, uh, what it is to not be spontaneous, et cetera, right? Right, and, and this is exactly what this plot is telling you. So this is the Gibbs energy as a function of, if you wish, the advance of reaction going from pure reactants to pure products. So now we see that in going in that direction, free energy decreases up to this up to this point where you have a minimum. So this would be the equilibrium composition and, and, the, and the fact that the free energy. So now it, you see this quantity here. This is the reaction free energy. And when you look at the mass here, then you realize that the free energy is equal to this reaction, the reaction free energy, the reaction Gibbs energy, times dn, where this is the variation in number of moles. So you see that this quantity is actually the slope, and this is exactly what we have here, so that it is the reaction free energy. So, so you have to understand the connection, between well, this the Gibbs free energy and the reaction free energy. Right. And, and you know, what this is showing, you know, kind of from the book is, is showing the relation between the uh, Gibbs energy and the chemical potential or, or right. the molar Gibbs energy and its relation to chemical potential. And, and I think it's very critical that we state here that, you know, this a plot is assuming constant, you know, temperature and pressure under Absolutely. these under these conditions. And it's one of those things that I like to always point it out because and, and this is something the book does really well in a lot of discussions too. What are the assumptions that go into this equation? What, you know, why when they take something from here, does it not work somewhere else? And it often has to do because different assumptions are being made. But this is saying we're looking purely at a chemical reaction while we're holding the most two common variables constant in any type of reaction and just looking at chemical work, which is to hold the temperature at a fixed temperature and the pressure usually right. to the external. And again, the mathematical connection. You see here that this plot is Gibbs energy with respect to composition. So this equilibrium point is simultaneously a point where you have a minimum in the Gibbs energy and therefore the derivative is zero. Right. So the two things go together. So the derivative changes sign here. So and it's positive derivative here and negative derivative. So we understand that we are looking at the function and simultaneously at the derivative of the function. So when this function reaches a minimum, the derivative goes to zero. And, and these are the two views of this, the, 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 keep the, the, end, the, the free energy and the reaction energy, which is the derivative. Right, okay. Um, and then this is kind of expanding on this to show you, you know, kind of several different conditions, right? A, B, and C is just where, uh, you know, what these curves would look like, again, under constant, you know, temperature and pressure conditions, um, you know, but where, uh, you know, where you're getting, in a sense, you know, different amounts of reaction or where that free energy minimum changes, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and as you've shown here, right, you know, this is where, you know, it spontaneously goes, it hits there. And now if it keeps trying to go in that direction, it's not spontaneous in that direction anymore. Right. But if you come back, it becomes spontaneous again. again because right. you see that way, the derivative. Increases. That's why it's critical. It's a minimum, you know, right. that it has right, to right, be right. that minimum. Right. Oh. Okay. Ouch. So. 
yeah, so so this is, a, I mean, a chemical, we, we cannot overemphasize that chemical equilibrium is probably one of the key applications, key concepts in thermodynamics that you are going to apply in, in any biological transformation, but it's not just the concept of equilibrium. It's what happens when you change something and then equilibrium is displaced. And then changing something might be that you change pressure if there are gases involved, you change temperature, and then you realize that you have to put all this together because all these plots, as Jeff is, has, has insisted a couple of times, these are at constant P and T. Now, what happens if you change T? Yeah. Now equilibrium is displaced. So you will have a very similar plot, but at a different temperature. So, so in, in a way, we have to imagine all this as a multidimensional surface. So you have at each fixed pressure and temperature, you have this, this plot, you change this condition, you have a different plot. So it's like you are moving on the well, and, and the surface. Well, and what you've just said, like whether you look at it as it's free energy or you look at it as equilibrium, you're basically, like you said, if you change the temperature, how does the equilibrium constant change with temperature? And, and you know, this is something that students get intimately familiar with and is something that I'm always surprised too that oftentimes they don't even realize you know that these can be decent changes the one I always like to point to back to our you know favorite biological molecule water is you know I always say like pure water what's you know what's the pH which has something to do with an equilibrium right that is yeah. an equilibrium reaction you know yeah. um, uh, a molecule going to two ions you know um, and uh, I'll say like does that have a temperature, you know, because they'll, you know, immediately just say pH seven, right? Like, I mean, they I'm like, is there a temperature dependence to that? And right. I'm always shocked how few students realize that there's not only a temperature dependence, but it's quite large. You know, if you change the temperature 50, 100 degrees, it you is. change the pH significantly. Now, if, if uh, to the, and to the unexperienced observer, if I change the temperature, then the, the, your example of water, change the, the, the temperature, then the concentration of hydrogen is changed. So now the question is, is water still neutral from the point of view of H and yeah. OH? As it turns out, yes, it is. Because what characterizes the neutral water is not just, uh, the, the, I mean, it's not the, not the just value the hydrogen of that, ion, the but value, the, but the fact that this is equal to uh, OH H minus. minus. Yeah. So indeed, pH and POH are related. Are, are, are related and yeah. they're and they're temperature dependent. Uh, so 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 this is a very very important example. Well, and it, you know from a practical standpoint too, and I think uh, you've illustrated it really well here, where they start making the connection, you know, between uh, free energy and equilibrium constant. Um, as well is, you know, and you've even shown it, you know, as well here where uh, you're, you're looking at that equilibrium constant and quickly realizing that, that this, you know, goes up, you know, logarithmically and not, you know, log base 10, but almost always these are natural logs, log based E. Um, uh, type uh, going and and as you can see in the exponential here that will be logarithmically uh, associated and so you know the other one I always try to remind students because they're so used to seeing reactions and calculating a free energy and then you know this relation back to equilibrium well then they you know you tell them like is this is reaction spontaneous they imagine just reactants going a hundred percent to products and and I'm like you know, um, and they're like, but that now doesn't jive with our thought of, well, it's always in equilibrium. There's always, you know, a certain amount. And I'm like, but once you start, you know, once students start really getting a feel for these logarithms and how, when those free energies get largely negative, you know, when you start looking at that equilibrium and, and it starts getting, you know, not 10 to the one or two, but 10 to the five, 10, 20, you know, et cetera, those concentrations get, you know, that, you know, minimum gets really, really far yeah, over yeah. to a product side. And, and the other thing that perhaps we should mention here is that you see in all these equations, although you might say equilibrium is displaced, and then it comes the question, so how long does it take for it to be displaced if you change something? Right. Now, the thermodynamic answer to that is we don't we don't have an answer. We don't have an answer to that. They the you time know. time 
Well, in equilibrium, not... in equilibrium thermodynamics, they don't have an right. answer. In non-equilibrium, right. you know, but in, in more advanced areas of thermodynamics, yeah. they get then, towards time scales. Then, but... then you have, whenever you want to, 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 to answer this question, how long does it take? You have to restore time in the description. And what happens is that for equilibrium thermodynamics, or, yeah, then time does not enter into the picture. And the assumption is that everything that is fast is already has already happened, but you don't know what fast means in in a particular uh, context. So, let's say geological terms they can be extremely long. Oh yeah, and well the one we all year. point out, right? Like diamond, yeah. diamonds right. are forever is a, a, a slogan, but it's yeah, not a reality. <laughs> They're not forever, but yeah. they don't change in your lifetime. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> For all practical purposes, they are forever. Yeah. Um, so, um, okay. And, uh, um, you know, I think that gets us to, you know, kind of looking at, at some of these overall concepts when we look at that free energy and, and non-spontaneous has to be, you know, driven through having another spontaneous reaction that can give some of that free energy so that the coupling of the two of them overall is negative. Yeah. Right. And um, you have some basic guidelines there that uh, it, it's a different ways of saying what you just said but again whenever you think about spontaneous non spontaneous and that the free energy for one can derive the, the the reaction for the other reactions a and b you have to think of this as a way this is related to the total entropy change whatever you can say here you can say there but this is a p and t constant and this it's not, this right. condition is not there. But you see, thinking in terms of entropy is the most general way, but we seldom use that in chemistry because yeah. the conditions in, 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 in terms of entropy require either fixing the total energy or fixing the total volume, and this is not the way we do things. It, so, so this is why this connection is so important. But you always have to take into account that when you discuss free energy, you are taking into account the environment. You are taking the account into account the environment under some specific conditions, and the specific condition is constant P and T. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I guess I state that, uh, you know, another like you said, like the the fundamental extremum principle is a maximum of entropy. But in for biochemists and chemists, especially in equilibrium thermodynamics, which is where we're going to spend all our time this semester, it's always a minimum of energy. We're almost always looking. Right. At. We're rarely looking at the maximum of entropy directly. We're usually looking at it proxy through its extremum in having there, therefore a relation to a type of energy, often the Gibbs free energy, because we're doing things at constant temperature pressure, where we're looking to minimize those energies uh, to look at where equilibrium yeah. is. Okay. Um, so I hopefully that uh, helped students with, uh, you know, looking at some of these ideas in, in chemical equilibrium and how they are associated, uh, you know, to biological systems. Thanks. Thanks to you.